you come to a place in your life that you find out, Lord, you're the onlyest way that I can make it. You're the onlyest way that I can make it. I tell you that sometimes life itself has a way to teach you lessons. The, life, the lessons that life teaches you is a lot more harsher than the lives that a teacher would try to teach you or that your mom and dad would try to teach you. You may can identify with this as moms and dads, as teachers sometimes, you try to teach your kids through the experiences that you've been through that if you go this route, it's not going to turn out good. You, you try to teach your kids, hey, if you do this, the results is not going to be good. We also come to a place in our life, and I'm going to say this, that we probably know more than what God knows concerning our lives. And if you don't believe that, just look at the way that we conduct our lives. We conducted our lives absent or separated from Him. And in doing so, that is making a statement that, Lord, I know best. I know what I want from my life. It's sort of like the idea of this prodigal son that says, I'm tired of living by the Father's rules. I know how to live my own life. Only to find out that later you find out that life gets a hold to you. Life, the Father was trying to tell you, don't leave home because here you're provided with certain things you didn't even have to work for nor struggle for. But, you're, but because of our rejection of the Father, we find out then because we're tired of being obedient to certain rules and regulations that now we find ourselves in the hog pen of life. And it's through these things that you can find, you can find people that's been through these situations. It's not hard. When you talk to them, they're very humbled. When you see them in worship service, they're very grateful because they have been there and they have realized, Lord, you are the very breath that I breathe. You are the very source of my life. And I'm going to tell you this morning that God desires to have this kind of relationship with you. I want you would this morning, good to have y'all with us today, and I want you would this morning turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, just one second. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to read verses 1 through 4, and I want to go over to the book of John chapter 7 and read verses 37 through 39. Just a couple verses right here. I want you to grab a hold to what I'm going to say here in this very first uh, section right here because it's going to be connected to something we're going to later bring out. In the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, is everybody, everybody there? Y'all have a good week this week while the one's still looking for it. Amen. Life has been good. God is good. Chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant or unlearn how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And look at verse 4. I want you to mark verse 4 down. I want you to keep a close a look on this. And did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock. And I want you to notice probably that word rock is capitalized here. That is, a, it's meaning something. He said, and all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. In the book of First John, in the book of John, in chapter seven, in verse thirty-seven. Through 39, I want to read something. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. In other words, he's making a proclamation. He's lifting his voice. And he is projecting this out. He wants everybody to hear what he has to say. 
he stood up. And it was a custom that when they taught, they would teach sitting down. But here he stood and he began to uh, raise his voice, to cry it out. And this is what he began to cry out. He said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the reading of your word. Your word that you have sent unto us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the life that we find in this word. And we ask you this morning for the next few minutes, Lord, we ask for your anointing to rest upon us. And, Lord, anoint us, Lord, to declare your word and do it in a very simplistic way that all ears will be open and attentive to this word. Anoint us also to hear your word, Lord. And we pray that the Spirit of God will move and, and minister in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to lay down something first and foremost here because we're talking about something. Just lay the foundation of what is taking place here in this setting of this. So please don't let me lose you here for the next first five minutes of this because this is very important that we grab a hold to this. And this is called a Feast of Tabernacles. This is what is taking place. If you go back to the first of, the, of John chapter 7, you're going to find out that they're celebrating a feast, a feast of tabernacles um, that it was called. And in this feast, all the Jewish males were required to appear before the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. So it's a big gathering. All the, the males are here. And they're all here to celebrate in this uh, a celebration. It was also an end of harvest season. And so to speak, it would be a time that they were celebrating or they was having a time of thanksgiving, a time to thank the Lord for the harvest and for the fruit of the land. It's sort of like today in our society when we celebrate thanksgiving in ourselves, we're thanking Him for providing a harvest, for, for being able to water the seed that we put in the ground and realizing and identifying that He is the one that has given the increase. It also goes on, and historically, it is a celebration of the days of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness, and it was to celebrate the deliverance from Egypt. It was a place where the Israelites were in bondage. Let me just give you a quick history on this. If you don't, are not familiar with this, the Israelites were in bondage to Egypt for several hundred years here, but God had delivered them. God had brought them out from up under the hand of Pharaoh who had control over who was suppressing them. But God brought them out. And do you know how he brought them out? The Bible says he brought them out by the blood of a lamb. I want you to get a hold of this because you're going to find out when you begin to read this word, it's going to begin to come alive. And even in the Old Testament, all the way till you get to the very back of the book in the index, you're going to find where Jesus is just woven all the way through here. And you're going to find out that that, that lamb that, was, that, that happened and that delivered them, the children of Israel from Egypt, is the same lamb that's going to deliver me and you. If you're going to be delivered, it's going to come through one thing and one thing only. And it's going going to come through the Lamb of God, Jesus, the Lamb of God. So they was here, they was in this celebration, man, they was going all out with it. If you don't think that they was going all out with it, it was the Israelites when they came, they would go out in their yard and make up makeshift tents and just live in it to, to, to remember what their forefathers had done and they're putting up tents in the wilderness there. I also like to look at it this way when they was in the winters. They didn't build a house there. They just put up a tent. Because when you find yourself in the winters, it's not a place to build a house. It's just a place to put up a tent because God has no place for you staying there. It's just a place that you're passing through. I want to just get this loud and clear this morning. So if you have found yourself in a wilderness of life, if you have found yourself in this kind of place, don't you build a house there? Don't you call the contractors and set up some? It's just a place that you're passing through. Oh, somebody ought to shout with me this morning. 
it was a time of reflection. Here, the, 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 the Feast of Tabernacles, it was a time of reflection. It was a time to remember that God had protected them. It was a time to remember that God had provided or was there provided provision for them and also had provided care. It was a time that they remembered it was during these 40 years in the wilderness that God's hand was upon our lives. And when we needed some uh, bread, he rained it down from heaven. And when we needed water, he brought it out of a rock. And when we needed guidance, uh, there was a cloud that led us in the daytime. And if we got lost in the night, he said, don't worry about that. I've got a pillow of fire that's going to lead you in the nighttime. God was showing the children of Israel, I want you to put your dependence upon me. He said, I'm the one who's brought you out, and I will be the one that carries you in. Ooh, a time of reflection of God being their redeemer, of God being their protector, and God being their provider. It was in the wilderness, I want you to grow up a hold to this. Are y'all with me? That God pro proved that he could provide a couple of critical elements. Don't you miss this because we're going to let her connect this in the end. It was in the wilderness that he proved that he could provide the very critical elements. And the two things that he proved he could provide was water and manna. And the reason I'm sharing this because physically you could not live without bread and water, so to speak. You're going to have, you can do what you want to do. And you might can think that you can make it without it. You can't even make it without the very necessity of water in your life. And, and it's interesting that God connects this to himself. It's interesting that he even connects bread to himself. Physically, you cannot live without some kind of manna and, some, and, and water in your life. If you do not have this as a diet in your life, you're going to dry up and die. This may give a great insight of why we're where we're at spiritually. Because Jesus said he, the Spirit of God was the water. He also said that he was the bread of life. His word to feast upon his word, to, to bask in the, the power of the Holy Spirit. He said because in Jesus Christ you're going to find life. Let me just give you something to think about here. It's, impo it's important that you don't confuse these three things. The physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. I'm going to say it one more time. It's important that you do not confuse these things. What happens in the physical and emotional is not what is happening in the spiritual. But what happens in the spiritual affects what happens to you in the physical and in the emotional. Oh, come on, somebody. You ever seen somebody, man, that God has got a hold to their life, and you'll say, this looks like a glow is upon you. There's something happening in the physical realm that's affected the way that you walk, the way that you talk, and the way that you carry yourself. But don't, whatever you do, you don't let what's happening in the physical and the emotional realm affect what is taking place spiritually. Because if you do, you're probably going to leave out of here depressed. I see a lot of time we get so wound up in the emotional, and yet before we can get out even out of church it seems like our life is dead you're dead we're dead spiritual we don't have no life don't get caught I want to tell you there's not but one person that can provide provide or give life and that is Jesus the Christ and him alone for seven days they reflected on what God had done and at the end they were still missing something I said for seven days, and I'm fixing to share something with you here. Y'all still with me? You cannot satisfy your spiritual thirst for God with physical experiences or what I would like to call religious experiences. Hello, somebody. Let me say it one more time because I think this is where we're at today. There's some, been some people that just come to church and say, I've come to try church. Bear with me here. I've done, I've done, done this thing. We, we've now mistaken something. 
You cannot satisfy your spiritual thirst for God with physical experiences or religious experiences. This is what, this is what most people are attempting to do, to be able to take care of their spiritual thirst. And they are emotionally moved for a moment, but soon discover they still spiritually empty. It happens all the time. I heard someone say one time that we had went somewhere and they began to say something. Said, "Did you feel what I felt in there?" I said, "You cannot. You can always go by your emotions." I said, "Because I remember a time. If you, uh, this may be over somebody's head. No, y'all all know this. Uh, that Whitney Houston was singing the national anthem and just goosebumps went all up and down my arms and legs. Uh, but you cannot be moved by what you, uh, emotionally. Something you got to be connected spiritually to." Jesus the Christ he is the provider of life do you see the difference in today's culture we use these terms we lose such religious terms as let me try church we use this we you are either I give that church thing a try and it didn't work stay with me here you're still empty and you're still thirsty why because we have a tendency trying to fulfill a spiritual need in a very religious manner we just want to do spiritual things in other words our life consists of we just want to be able to check certain things off of our box or we have a list that I must do this week I must do this as we can check it off of my box I went to church I went I sit in the pew I listened for a little bit I was on my phone I was daydreaming but I was in the house we just I've checked it off of my box I've done religious things only at the end of it you find out that you're still spiritually empty you're still spiritually thirsty you cannot quench this thirst in a physical manner, in an emotional manner, or in the religious realm. This thirst was created in you to draw you to a person. Come on, somebody. To draw you into a relationship with a person. And it can't be quenched by any other source, method, or person except through God the Son and the power of of his Holy Spirit we want to have our thirst quenched without getting the substance in us we we we're wanting something but we don't want to spend the time me and my wife is fixing to celebrate 30 years together it took some time to get here and a lot of rough roads. But I promise you that if I just spent one day a week with her, one hour a day, it wouldn't go good. Am I making it real? Let's just get where the rubber meets the road. But yet we expect for my thirst, my desire to be quenched. I've looked, I, I thought money would do it, only to, ex, only to expel every in, in measure of energy I had trying to get more. Only that when I got to the amount that I thought I had, I was still thirsty. That won't do it. So we spent a lot of times looking, as the old song used to say, country song, looking for love in all the wrong places so you get here this 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 thirst that we have can only be cured by one means and it comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ it cannot be taken care of by material things no more money, more money, this would not do it. It cannot be quenched by any other source, any other method, or any other person except through God the Son and the power of His Holy Spirit. I want to plead with you this morning. 
It's time to get real. I want to plead with you this morning. It's time to get serious. I brought in a while ago, if I just spent probably an hour or a week with my wife, our relationship would probably not go good at all. Could you agree, all the married couples, could you agree with me on that? That probably ain't going to go too good. We're going to find out we don't know much about her and she don't know much about me. It's not just going to go well at all. And we're going we're gonna to wonder and we're going to scratch our head, but you're going to say, well, I've come home and I've done certain things that was on the list. Mm, he's making it real now, ain't he? But I've done certain things that was on the list, but yeah, but I haven't seen you but for an hour. Why is it that we know in the physical realm that that's not going to end up very well? But yet somehow or another, when we get into the spiritual realm, we think this is going to solve all of our problems. So what do I have to do? I just need to get to church, and I, if I can just last for one hour in there, that I can check it off my list and tell the Lord, well, I've done what you require. No, no, that ain't what he required out of you. He wants a relationship with you, and he don't want an hour of your time out of seven days a week, out of 24 hours a day. He wants a relationship with you. If you want that spiritual thirst to be taken care of, I promise you right now, you're going to find out something. When you start to draw near to him, you're going to find out that he's going to start to draw near unto you. That when you get up in the morning, you're going to desire, i got to find his word and see what it says. I just need to go sit on my front porch and I begin, need to pray. What you going to ask? I didn't come to ask God for nothing. I just come to talk to him because relationship is more than just asking what I need in my life. Relationship is my amazing. Make a connection with the Savior, with your Redeemer, who wants to have a relationship with you. And so we find ourselves here. Something very interesting that takes place here. There is an invitation that takes place. Jesus says this. In the book of John in chapter 7, this feast has taken place. And they're doing a couple of things. They're, they're celebrating what God had done for them, where he had brought us from. They had celebrated and talked about everything that he had done in the past. And here now they find themselves in a celebration of tabernacles where they're recognizing he's our provider. He's our manna from heaven. He's our water out of a rock. And on the last day of the feast, they start to do something. This priest on the last day, they've done it for seven, they done it for the sixth day. But on the last day, they'd done it, I think, seven times. It was the last day of the feast. The people around celebrating, the people around all just all excited. And the priest is going down to this pool by the name of Siloam. Anybody ever heard it? We make a mention of it. And they're carrying vessels with them. And they're dropping these vessels down into the water. And they're bringing them back to a place called the temple. I want you to get into your, get a, get a picture of this. Because where is Jesus at at this time? He's sitting in the temple. Who are they sitting there looking to and who are they remembering from bringing them out? Who was the bread of life in the wilderness? Hmm. His very presence was in their midst, and yet they did not recognize him. They was going through religious activities, and as they had these, these vessels of water, they was bringing them back, and they were singing songs. Songs such as, with joy we shall draw waters out of the wells. Of salvation with joy we would draw waters out of the well of salvation they would bring these vessels back and they would take them and pour them out here at the altar in remembrance what's this right here in remembrance of when they was thirsty oh my Lord in the wilderness anybody with me in remembrance of when they was thirsty in the winters and we didn't have nobody to be able to quench our thirst. and We didn't know what was going to happen. And the Lord spoke to Moses and he says, take the rod that's in your hand and strike that rock. And when they struck the rock, water 
began to flow out of it. And the water began to take care of the thirst that they was quenching for. You're not with me right here. Uh, Jesus stood up that day and he looked at the conversation and he tells the congregation there, he said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me. You know, you didn't get what I said at the very early, at the very beginning of it, because he said in the winters, that rock, that rock, that rock that that water came out of, that y'all all excited about, that fed those forefathers, Jesus is saying, that rock is here. The rock that provided water for your forefathers in the wilderness, that was me. He said, so if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He was crying out to the people, crying out to them. This religious ceremonies that you're going through is not going to be able to do it. And tomorrow you're going to leave, you're going to get home, and you're going to be empty. But Jesus said, if you will come to me, he said, I will give you a river of living water. Oh, I don't make you want to preach. Jesus said, I am the one. I am the one. Here I am in your presence and you've overlooked me. I am the one that can quench your thirst. Man, I'm that rock. I'm that rock. I'm the same rock that was in the winters that your forefathers looked to. It was interesting. Let me just stop here just one second because in the Old Testament, he the Lord took him, told him, and says, I want you to smite the rock. And when he smited the rock, water come out. Oh, well, who did he say that rock was? He said that rock was Christ. My Lord. What did they do to him on a hill called Golgotha? Mm, they smited the rock. And when they smited the rock, they thought they was going to kill him. But what they didn't know, they was about to provide life. A spiritual thirst was about to be quenched. That forefathers for years and years had hungered for. And Jesus said, I am the one who's come to quench your thirst. Jesus was saying, I'm the same rock that provided to, to quench the thirst for your forefathers. I'm here now. The promise has been fulfilled. I'm here in your presence. The invitation was given and the promise was declared. Watch this. He said, he that believeth on me out of his belly. He said, any man thirst, let him come unto me. Please do not miss this part. Jesus is crying out. He stood to his feet. I don't know whether he had any mannerism like South Alabama, but I would have cut my hands. You know what I mean? I'd have cupped him where I could have felt like I was projecting my voice out even further. And he, but he cried out. He said, if any man thirst, as they was pouring water out at the altar, Jesus stood up and said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. He gives an invitation. Come unto me if you're thirsty. Come unto me. If you're hungry, come unto me. Jesus said, I'm not only can able to take care of your spiritual thirst. He said, I am also the bread of life that is able to take care of your spiritual desires. Ooh. The same person that was parading manna down was feeding your forefathers in the wilderness is here. Watch this. He said, he that believeth on me out of his belly shall flow rivers. I said rivers of living water. This may be better understood when you look in the book of John in chapter 4. You're going to find out that a Samaritan woman comes to a well. Y'all probably heard this. You probably heard. She come drawing water. And Jesus said, if you drink of that water... You're going to thirst again, but I got some water if you drink of it. It is eternal, and you shall never thirst again. Matter of fact, Jesus says, I shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Not only was God satisfying the thirst, but, he was his, but your life will become like an artesian well. I don't know if any of y'all ever seen an artesian well. You don't have to turn no faucet to get it out. You don't have to have a pump to pump it out. It's just something that just 
gushes up out of the ground. And Jesus said, well, I am going to put a river in your life that is going to overtake you. He is not just describing some gentle stream flowing through a desert or through a forest. He's describing water flowing violently over a canyon that causes flooding. Whew. Grab a hold of this. I said he's not talking about a river or a stream flowing through some gentle, gently flowing through some, through some forest. He's talking about a raging, violent river rolling over a canyon causing flooding. This is the life that God wants you to have. Whew, man, there's something that's being said here. And as you're not just a vessel to contain the river, but a vessel by which his river flows. Mm. God is wanting to flood your life. I said God is wanting to flood your life. So much of his life that you will not even be able to contain it. I said that God is wanting to flood your life with his life with so much that you will not even be able to to contain it. Whoo! Lord, help me here. Have you ever noticed when you're around somebody just full of spirit? You don't, nobody has to put up a flag. Nobody had to say something. You just said, man, this person here was full of the spirit of God. I think, how did you know that? Because it's like a raging river. It overflows enough. If you get around them, it's going to get up on you. And God is saying, I want to fill your life into a, such a measure that your life overflows with who I am. Man, I'm going to close with this. I want you to stand your feet here this morning. Hallelujah. Ain't he good? I said, ain't he good? I want the praise and worship team to come up here with me for a minute. Hallelujah. Man. God said, I am that rock. I can provide the spiritual, I can quench the spiritual thirst. Maybe Jesus stood that day and watched the people and had observed them. And he watched them as they went through all their religious activity. And probably could sit there and sense that they're fixing to leave here. And tomorrow, that thirst still would not be quenched. You sit here this morning, you say, well, we listen. I'm going to throw you. We listen to a great preacher preach this morning. <laughs> Surely that ought to help me. No, that ain't going to do it. 